Hi, my name's Mike Benninger, and I'd like to talk to you today about what I think is the future of allergy testing, which is component testing. My disclosure is I have been a consultant for Thermal Fisher. So I'd like to talk first about the history of allergy testing. And Really, the first uh, pollen test with pollen was uh, done in 1872, but by 1920, skin prick testing was pretty standardly used. In 1967, IgE was discovered, and then subsequently there were a number of in vitro tests, particularly RAS testing that was done. And it was in the late 80s and early 90s that a more fully animated specific IgE testing was, was made available. And then lastly, in 2005, component resolved diagnostics, which would be the focus of this discussion, uh, was identified. <clears throat> so we know that there is this one airway hypothesis that suggests an association between allergy and upper and lower respiratory tract disease with asthma, conjunctivitis, dermatitis, rhinitis, sinusitis, and polyposis. We also know that most patients are polysensitized and they're allergic to more than one allergen. And oftentimes they'll have a perennial allergy that just kind of sits in the background. And then they have a seasonal impact where their symptoms become much more significant. And understanding what they're allergic to and reducing allergy exposure is very important in their care. Skin uh, testing has been available for a long time and is the mainstay of allergy testing. But more recently, the use of in vitro testing, starting with RAST and modified RAST, and more recently, the enzyme-linked immunoassays, and particularly immunocap, has become a simpler and equivalent way of evaluating patients for allergies. And when we look at that, we know that if they have allergic rhinitis, that if we eliminate um, the things that they're allergic to, that their symptoms will be reduced. And then we can integrate other therapies as needed. <laughs> so we've spent a lot of time looking at in vitro allergy testing. We are a, a regional test site for the Midwest um, for allergy testing with immunocap. And we had the opportunity to look at over 125,000 specimens just to see what the most common positive allergy tests were. <clears throat> and it was dog, cat, dust mites, grass, and ragweed, and timothy grass were the most common. We also looked at food panels and milk, peanut, wheat, egg white, and soybean were the most common. And then we tried to relate these to comorbid allergic conditions. And what we were able to find is that if you associate specific allergies to asthma, molds, dander, and weeds are the most common. For allergic rhinitis, it is molds, weeds, and grasses. And for atopic dermatitis, it is molds, weeds, and dander. In the international consensus statement on allergy uh, and uh, rhinology, um, they noted that it has been demonstrated that serum IgE shows excellent correlation with both um, nasal challenge tests as well as skin testing in the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis. And essentially they determined that these were equivalent tests. So how do we interpret our specific IgE testing? So if the specific Ig is normal and total Ig is normal, they're not allergic. If they're both positive, the patient is allergic. However, if the specific IgE is positive and total Ig is normal, it suggests that they truly are allergic, that they may not have a significant allergic response or are not in the allergic season. And if the specific Ig is normal, but the total Ig is elevated, then you start to look at other things, other IgE-mediated disease. So in summary, we can use IgE to assess uh, uh, whether or not somebody's allergic, and we can use these to make a decision about how we treat the patients. <clears throat> so what is molecular allergology? It is a really a breakthrough that enables quantification of specific proteins at a molecular level or, or components to make a diagnosis. So what is it? Um, every allergen has multiple proteins where there's the possibility that the individual may be allergic. 
And with this, we can actually make an, an assessment of whether or not there's cross reactivity or there's very specific allergic sensitization. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the future. We also know that certain foods that people test positive for, uh, that when they're heated, they're denatured and the people are no longer allergic. So that is the case in many patients with egg, egg allergy. So what has happened is this ability to do DNA sequencing and develop a specific uh, architecture of each global allergen to identify the specific proteins and whether or not the patient may have developed allergy to those specific proteins. With this, we're able to create very specific immune recognition. We can look at prevention, therapy, and diagnosis. You know it's allergy, but how severe is it? Is the sensitization genuine? Is your patient optimally managed? It all boils down to the allergen components involved. Let me explain. An allergen source contains thousands of molecules, of which only a few are allergenic. Components are proteins with different characteristics that affect the consequences of sensitization. Specific components are more or less unique to the source, indicating that the patient's sensitization is genuine. Sensitization to cross-reactive components indicate that the clinical symptoms seen may be caused by another allergen source because antibodies recognize similar components from the different sources. Sensitization to allergen components can be measured individually in separate tests, revealing if the patient is sensitized to a specific or cross-reactive component. Allergen components are grouped into protein families, which are of different stability and are present in varying amounts. Labile components mainly give rise to local reactions. Stable proteins, on the other hand, may cause systemic reactions. To conclude, molecular allergology takes allergy diagnosis one step further enabling you to assess the risk for clinical reactions, explain symptoms due to cross-reactivity, and identify the right patients for specific immunotherapy. So a good place to go is this, uh, um, the, e, the European Allergy Association has this uh, pediatric allerg allergy um, and immunology paper, you can pull it down online. And then probably more important was the EAACI Molecular Allergology User's Guide, which is readily available for anybody online. And a lot of the slides I'm going to show you going forward are actually from their uh, presentations. So one of the things to try to figure out is how do we name these components? So it basically, you will look at three different parts to this uh, the description. Uh, the first is actually the specific allergy. And then it's the particular allergen. So core A1 is a, a component test. Stability was mentioned in the video and the more stable the allergen or the protein, the more likely it is to cause systemic reactivity. And therefore many of the things that we see rely on the amount of stability to determine whether or not we are having an allergic response. This has to do with disulfide bonds contributing to protein stability. And if there's a free allergen, it's different than one that creates a stable dimer. So if you create a stable dimer or a stable allergen matrix complex, then you're more likely to have a systemic reaction to that allergen. So as we look at the use of molecular allergology, it's a little bit different. So if you're looking at monosensitized patients, Standard testing such as specific IgE or skin testing is great, but the more polysensitized they are, the more likely it is that they will have specific components that overlap with other uh, allergens. 
And therefore, if you're looking at associated clinical reaction, you're more likely to have be able to evaluate people with significant high clinical reactions, such as peanuts, with, with by assessing the mo uh, molecules, and more important to use the molecules for polysensitization. The abundance in whole extract is also important. If there's a high abundance, then skin testing in SIGE is very effective. But if there's a low abundance, then molecular testing is better. And if it's very, if there's very low stability, then molecular testing is also better. So the perfect example is peanut. So looking at cross-reactivity between birch, peanut, and apple, traditional diagnostics may show that you're allergic to all three, but with allergology, you can make a difference. Protein stability is really important for peanuts. So in one study, 77% of peanut allergic patients are not at ris risk for severe reactions such as um, anaphylaxis. And we can identify those people by looking at the very specific proteins. And basically, RH1, 2, and 3 are the three proteins that cause a, a significant or potential anaphylactic reaction, where if you have these other components, you can assume that they're not going to have that severe reaction and they could have more exposure. <clears throat> furry animals is my favorite because there's a lot of interest in furry animals. And each of the furry animals have a number of overlapping uh, allergens. So if you test positive for cat or dog, you're more likely to test positive for horse, but you may not be allergic to all three. And it depends on the specific proteins that do it. And so Equus C3, KNF3, and FELD2 are the specific proteins that suggest you are allergic to that specific animal. So here's a perfect example. So you have cat dander, you have FELD1 a positive, but FELD2 and 4 are negative. You have a primary sensitization to cat. If you have FELD1 positive, FELD2 and 4 positive, you're probably primarily allergic to cat, but you may be sensitive to other animals. But if FELD1 is negative and FELD2 and 4 are positive, you have a cross sensitization to cat without a true allergy. And then you can identify whether or not you're allergic to dog or horse. You know, one of the interesting thing with pet allergies, particularly with dog allergies, is that 40% of dog allergic patients are only allergic to one specific protein or component and that's in male dogs. And therefore uh, you can get a female dog or you can get a very young neutered male dog. The same thing's true if we look at tree pollen related allergy families. So each of these families have specific proteins in relationship to them. And you can use these to identify whether or not somebody's allergic. So if they're monoreactive, then it makes it relatively easy. But if they're polyreactive, then you can look at the very specific proteins and you can make a decision of whether or not they're primarily allergic to tree pollen or to some other antigen. Uh, the same thing is true with grasses because there's very great overlap between the grasses. And if you look at this, for example, if you look at olive, burnt, temperate grasses or subtropical uh, grasses, all of these proteins overlap. And so you may be positive to them, but for example, BETV1 is primarily in birch and PHL P5 and 6 is primarily in grass pollens. Same thing's true with weeds, where you could take weeds and you can do SIG, I, uh, SIIGE for ragweed. It's positive um, for one or the other for mugwort. But if they're both positive, you could do with the specific testing. And if, for example, AMBA1 is positive, but ARTV1 is negative, then the primary sensitization is to ragweed and not to mugwort. The other thing is, is looking at cross sensitization across different species. So you have Timothy grass, you have mugwort, which is a weed, and you have a birch tree. And if you test for them, you can see that it, all of them will have procalcinin and profilin. So you, would, you may test positive for all three, but if you look at the very specific antigens and the very specific proteins, PLHP1 and PLHP5, suggest that you're truly allergic to Timothy. Um, we can use this in identification of, of whether or not we're going to do a 
um, uh, immunotherapy. So we can identify the very specific antigens for which we, we, the very specific allergens for which we do immunotherapy based on this profile. One of the big um, um, future is the ability of, to, to, mul to test multiple proteins at the same time or ISAC. And basically it's, it allows, it's a blood test where we can do multiple um, uh, components in a microarray technique. So basically a drop of blood will allow us to evaluate over a hundred components. So you could look at this or you could look at this and you can identify the same specific components. And there are multiple components uh, that have been approved by the FDA at this time. So we can also use this evaluating um, childhood allergies. So we know that atopic dermatitis tends to be first followed by, allerg uh, by food allergies and allergic rhinitis, and then asthma. We know that BET B1 is a very specific uh, component that if positive very young, that there is a high likelihood that this per these people by the age of 16 are gonna have significant symptoms and asthma. And so we can look at BETB1 and make a decision about how aggressively we treat these children going forward. So basically what happens now is we're looking at how we used to be able to evaluate people with allergies. We could use the top-down approach with clinical history and physical examination, identifying um, specific allergies, by skin or blood testing, and then making a diagnosis and treatment. Or the opposite is true. We could do this allergen microarray, test for 115 different components, and then our work, work our way back up to the symptomatic patients and then initiate treatment very, very specifically. So it's kind of an opposite approach. Asthma is particularly interesting. It affects a number of Americans. Um, it's growing in prevalence. We know that most people who have allergies um, have allergic triggers. Pediatric asthmatic, 90% have allergic triggers and 60% of adult asthmatics. We also know that most of these patients are uncontrolled most of the time. And that with children, they have uh, daily symptoms about 92% of the time. In diabetes and dyslipidemia, we start with lab tests and then make a decision related to pharmacotherapy. And why can't we do this with Ig profiling and with um, allergy testing and component testing to target exposure reduction and pharmacotherapy? And this is basically how we would do this in a typical immunocap panel. We know that targeted reduction dramatically reduces symptoms. And so if you can reduce exposure, we can reduce Fewer symptom days by 21, missed days of school by 44, and fewer ER visits by two. And we can dramatically reduce hospitalizations uh, and ED visits. And we've shown this clearly in a paper where we identified the specific antigens that create a phenotype of an allergic asthmatic, and thereby we can reduce um, emergency room visits, medication use, uh, clinic visits, and hospitalizations. And these were the results. House dust, cat, dog, and moles are the ones that are really most significant in those patients, and we can focus on them very specifically. So in summary, we can reduce asthmatic triggers. We can, uh, allergic triggers, we can reduce asthmatic severity. We've built these into our care pathway. So in acute bacterial sinusitis, if people have not responded to um, antibiotic therapy, um, then we will automatically get either skin testing or blood testing for allergies. Same is true for adult asthmatics. In fact, in adult asthmatics, our care pathway includes trigger identification and trigger avoidance since, since there's such a high prevalence of allergic asthmatics. And we're also building it into our chronic disruptive pulmonary disease management and diagnosis. So in summary, I hope you realize that there's now a way to use component testing to maximize our clinical practices and to improve patient care. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Elina Toskala. I'm the director of allergy in Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia, and part of the rhinology and skull base team. I am both a rhinologist as well as allergist by training, originally trained in Finland. So I have a little different training that many people in the field. I did full fellowship in rhinology and skull base, but also in allergy for one year. Um, I'm going to talk today about current concept of treatment of allergic rhinitis. Let me just advance the slide. There we go. And my disclosures are that I'm a member of advisory board for JSK and shouldn't have effect on this lecture. So what is allergy? Why are we worried about these proteins in our environment? They don't do anything to us. You can breathe them, you can eat them, you can contact them on your skin. And obviously you can get allergic reactions to some medications. But the classical allergy is environmental proteins and those harmless pollen particles or animal dander causes reaction in many parts in our body. We can have the reactions in the nose, throat, mouth, ears, obviously eyes, skin. We can inhale these particles and we can have the symptoms in our GI tract. Here you see conjunctival irritation in allergic conjunctivitis. Here is a skin reaction of an immediate allergic reaction and then late phase reaction. Um, allergic response is based on activation of eosinophils and mast cells releasing the inflammatory mediators, uh, then further activating also basophils, B cells becoming memory cells forming and producing IgE that our body then every time we get in touch with this protein again that we've been sensitized will be releasing and causing then on the surface of um, T cells with antigen presenting cells activation of T2, TH2 cells and this all happening on the surface on the mucosal lining causing this a continuous um, activation of TH2, eosinophilic inflammation, and must tell um, release of the inflammatory markers. So that's just the quick background about the history. Uh, I'm sorry, the immunology. Um, allergy epidemic has been going on for 20, um, I, no, I would say actually 40 years. Um, or how do you count this depending when we really start to see the high, the last 20 years has been really high increase in asthma, allergic rhinitis. Atopic eczema may be a bit plateaued, but still all of these compared to 1970s, 19, um, maybe mid 1970s. And then even on the early 80s, it wasn't too bad. But now we think that uh, allergy really is becoming an epidemic. Obviously we have our COVID epidemic, it's not the same thing, but this is something that in our environment has changed and causes us to react to these harmless proteins. We also know that there's a genetic predisposition for developing allergy. And we published in Nature Communication some years ago, study showing that uh, early childhood eczema is a risk for later developing asthma. And these patients also have food allergy and allergic rhinitis risk. So it's not just the environment. You can also have a bad choice for your parents and can have a higher risk of developing allergic diseases. We obviously have several allergic diseases. We have allergic asthma, we have allergic rhinitis, and we have allergic dermatitis. Mainly it starts as an atopic march with atopic dermatitis, then patient might develop asthma and later also allergic rhinitis. And allergy is continuing developing disease, often chronic lifetime disease that will affect many organs. We know that skin test positivity in Europe is anywhere between 30 to 52 percent. This is a large study we did some years ago in uh, 13 different European countries. Same in US, we know that at least one indoor allergen positivity is 43%, outdoor allergen about 40%. Why is this important for an ENT? We do see a lot of patients. We do surgeries for chronic sinusitis. 
we treat the upper airways. We are the first in line to treat these patients. So it's very important to recognize the fact that runny nose is not just a runny nose. It increases risk of asthma developing if allergic rhinitis is not treated up to three times. Also, um, duration of rhinitis is increased the increased risk of asthma. When you combine rhinitis and sinusitis, your asthma risk increases even further. So the point here is to say that as an ENT, we should treat allergic rhinitis and chronic sinusitis. We also know that our surgical results are better if allergy is addressed. And um, what is behind all this increased allergy, uh, increased asthma, increased allergic rhinitis, eczema, food allergies? We think it has something to do with hygiene hypothesis, which means that before 1960s, we didn't have a lot of antibiotics, vaccinations. Uh, we were much more in touch with the, with the earth and getting our food from um, environment much better than we did when we live in this urban environment. In the urban environment, you, your food is processed, it's clean, it doesn't have any bacteria, the milk is pasteurized, and we treat all the infections with antibiotics and get all the vaccinations. Obviously, all of these are important. We don't want to stop any of the vaccination or any of needed antibiotics, but we need to get more in touch with the environmental microbiome because it's been shown that if your microbiome is very um, um, urban or poor, you don't have a diversity of microbiome on your skin, on your airways, in your gut, you will easier develop allergies. And when you think about the rural living, we have inverse correlation with antibiotic use, hay fever and atopy. There's a long-term exposure and early exposure to the farming where you have exposure to unpasteurized food, vegetables from your background garden. This is a study we did between Finnish and Russian uh, Karelia, people living in urban versus rural environment and found big difference in allergy sensitization, showing that in Finnish urban environment, children had much higher uh, allergy than their mothers and both mothers and children much higher than on the very rural side of Russia, where people get the drinking water from this kind of places. It's a surface water, it's not chlorinated. The allergy prevalence was much lower than uh, on the Finnish side. Even the environment and the climate and the genetics is pretty much the same. We do know that urbanization increases um, use of food preservation. I talked milk pasteurization, vacuum cleaners, um, all these indoor air quality issues, outdoor pollution. Um, it just increases our exposure. And it's been also thought in hygiene hypothesis that when we don't have any more of those bad infections that would activate our Th1 response, our Th2 response comes overreactive. And that's what we talk about when you're um, getting overreaction or allergic reaction. And that's why we do the hyposensitization for patients because you are hypersensitive to these environmental proteins. And the culprit is the Th2 that is activated because Th1 don't get infections all, all through our early childhood, not as much, don't get the microbes everyday life. So it doesn't fight anything and immunity have to stay active. So Th2 is overreactive. What we want to do is to downregulate of this hyperactive Th2 response and make us to be able to tolerate these proteins. Because again, I keep saying they are harmless. They don't cause any infections. It's microbes that cause virus, bacteria, fungal can cause infections. These just cause a reaction on our, from our own immune system. So that was just a quick background. I have short time to talk about allergy, but I just wanted to talk to you about the background. And here we talk about what uh, document I'm using mainly for my uh, recommendations for treatment and diagnosis. We published some years ago extensive international consensus statement of allergic rhinitis um, and 
this was uh, Sarah Weiss, Sandra Lynn and me being the authors or editors of this and all these other um, experts around the world were part of this. It's available online and we're actually aiming to get an update in about a year. So all the evidence that I saw is really based on our ICAR document. Um, so what is the most recommended allergy testing? It's a skin prick test. Uh, it's very quick, easy, gets you immediate 15, 20 minutes reading of the environmental allergens that you can test on the patients. Uh, some people can't do it because their skin reacts to any scratch, that's called demographism, and these patients need to get blood work, uh, to uh, total IgE and specific IgE, mainly specific IgE, also small children that don't like pricking of the skins, the blood work might be the way to go. And then there are a few medications that you can't be on when we do the skin test. Uh, mainly uh, beta blockers and some of the um, antidepressants and antihistamines that has to be stopped before the testing. Beta blocker, as everybody knows, is, is reason for that is that if you're on beta blocker and there would be hypothetical anaphylactic reaction action from the allergy testing, the, the uh, epinephrine might not help or would be dangerous to give when you're on a beta blocker. So that's the reasoning behind that. And um, just the testing, that's kind of simple. You either do a blood work or you do your skin testing, right? You ask patients, when do you are most reactive? You correlate the results of your testing with the, um, the result you find from the specific IGs, whether it's a skin test or the blood work. Just positive test doesn't mean allergy. You obviously have to have symptoms as well. So if you tolerate your dog, even if you have a little bit of reaction, you're probably hypersensitized to the dog having been exposed to that. When we start the treatment of allergies, we start with uh, medication. We do the pharmacotherapy, which I review quickly. What are the recommended evidence-based uh, medication that are there available for us? We obviously can do some of the avoidance, but if you love your dog and you're allergic and you can keep your symptoms controlled with medication and maybe keep the dog out of the bedroom, you might not want to do that. You might be able to avoid some of the exposures in the pollen season by closing the doors, using HEPA filters and so on, but there's just so much you can do avoidance. So immunotherapy offer, op, offers us an option of getting hypersensitized, giving you three to four years of that protein you're allergic to that you finally just don't react to much of it and you're forming a blocking antigens. But first, uh, indication for um, immunotherapy is that you've tried the medication. We have oral steroids, uh, topical steroids, we have drops, we have sprays, we have inhalers for asthma, anti triens nasal decongestants that obviously both oral and topical are only for short term and not really help with allergy, just relieve the symptoms, antihistamine, both oral and topical. And what is the evidence? The oral antihistamines is level um, A and it's recommended for, let me just move this away. Here we are. Strong recommendation based on the evidence that we did for our ICAR. This table is from the ICAR allergic rhinitis. You see a strong recommendation, especially the new, newer generation, non-sedating oral H1 um, antihistamines. Sometimes patients still need the Benadryl, maybe for the nights, if it's a really bad season. Uh, but in general, the non-sedative ones are the recommended ones. Intranasal corticosteroid, strong recommendation. They should be used as a first-line therapy in allergic rhinitis. Um, nasal saline, strong recommendation. Saline rinse or uh, sprays are recommended to wash off that allergen and the thick mucus from the nose and then use your topical nasal sprays. And if you combine your nasal steroids to a topical, um, here is a combination of intranasal corticosteroid and intranasal antihistamine, strong recommendation. I'm sorry, the red area was missed from here, but that's the fourth one. And studies have shown that if you do the combination, I 
prescribe them two separate ones because it's cheaper, but there's also a product that you can prescribe uh, as one. It might be more expensive, but the point is that when you combine the antihistamine and uh, steroid, those sprays together are effective, more effective than either one alone. So I, then that's the medication was recommended. It's pretty straightforward. I'm immunotherapy is recommended for allergic rhinitis, for asthma and venom-induced anaphylaxis. You can give it as a sublingual or subcutaneous, and it can prevent asthma and new sensitization on patients that are on it. It can change the course of the allergic disease and help you to tolerate better for up to 12 years, uh, the proteins in, the, in your environment. And Based on ICAR, again, what's the level of evidence? Subcutaneous immunotherapy, strong recommendation. Sublingual immunotherapy, strong recommendation. Then there is some studies done with trans and epicutaneous immunotherapy, uh, not good evidence, and it's not being recommended. And then intralymphatic might be a new way of doing with only few shots into the lymph nodes. Again, more study level at this point, but maybe something for the future. So what is the indication for subcutaneous immunotherapy? Um, as I said, you have to have the allerg positive allergy testing and symptoms. You have tried medication and then you decide to go for subcutaneous immunotherapy. I discuss obviously or sublingual, either drops or tablets, but the, if this is what patients choose, we talk about the risk. There is a risk of anaphylaxis and fatalities are reported two per two, 29 million injections, about 2% of systemic reactions. You have to be prepared to treat the anaphylactic reaction. You have to know what to do, how to treat it, and have everything prepared in your office, have a, your nurse trained for that so that you know how to treat it. And it's treatable when you quickly use EpiPen, use antihistamine, steroid, maybe IV, send patient to the ER. And they have to be followed at least eight hours because there's a delayed reaction. Delayed reaction can happen and cause again, especially low airway symptoms. Most reactions that are dangerous are patients with asthma, and it's important to ask that patient asthma is well controlled before giving your shot. Sublingual immunotherapy has never killed anybody, can, has reported few uh, anaphylactic reactions, but nothing that's been fatal. You can give them as a drop or a tablet. We have tablets available, three of them. Uh, I Don't we have four now? Uh, because we have a dust mite, we have grass tablet, uh, two different grasses, and then uh, wheat pollen. And so those are available as a tablet and FDA approved and covered by some insurances. Sublingual immunotherapy drops, patient pay out of pocket. And when you look at the evidence, I just again have a little time to look in the immunological studies, but sublingual immunotherapy is safe, obviously. Uh, subcutaneous, when you prepare to take care of the anaphylaxis in good hands is also safe, but risk is higher when you discuss with the patient. Uh, sublingual immunotherapy might be a little lighter on the evidence of immunological response. It's still been shown to be effective, but subcutaneous maybe have a little stronger immunological effects. But we know what happens with immunotherapy. You get blocking antigen IgG4, you have increased uh, production of IFN gamma, IL4, you have reduced eosinophilic chemotaxis adhesion and CD4 positive T cell activation, meaning that that TH2 response is reduced with immunotherapy when you give it up to three years. You can go, the recommendation now is three to five years, but then you should stop. The benefit should be 12 years. So indication again, IG mediated allergic disease. Uh, you have a positive test and symptoms pers pers uh, persist despite pharmacotherapy. And then you discuss which uh, immunotherapy you would give. This is my last slide to bring up biologics. It's not 
indicated for allergic rhinitis, but a lot of your patients who have chronic sinusitis and asthma or allergic dermatitis might have allergic rhinitis. And we now have three biologics approved for chronic sinusitis with nasal polyps. And then there are for asthma, some other ones as well as for psoriasis and chronic urticaria. So when patients are biologic, you might see the benefit for the allergic rhinitis as a kind of a side effect side effect of, of the treatment or benefit of the treatment. And just to finish up as a surgeon, we need to take care of also the allergies, take a, do our surgeries, but then treat the chronic inflammation that allergies cause.
Hello, and welcome to this talk on penicillin allergy testing. My name is Christine Franzies, and I am the Director of Allergy at the University of Missouri in Columbia. I'm a general otolaryngologist, and I've been in practice in Missouri for about six years. Today, we're going to talk about penicillin allergy testing and potentially adding it to your practice. Here are my disclosures, just for your information. None of them are related to this talk. And our objectives today will be to discuss the indications for penicillin allergy testing, recognize the need for it, which there is a great need and you can definitely offer a lot to your patients, review the criteria, so who potentially could be a candidate for allergy testing, as well as to describe the procedure, which if you've done any skin prick testing or intradermal testing, you'll be very familiar with, understand how to interpret the test, as well as the different safety parameters and precautions this lecture also contains some useful, some useful resources uh, at the end, particularly a penicillin allergy uh, toolkit reference, which you can definitely implement in your practice. So if you don't have any pre-made forms and you would like to not reinvent the wheel, you will definitely find this penicillin allergy toolkit very helpful. <clears throat> so why might you consider this, particularly as an otolaryngologist? Well, some of the most common infections that we see, like otitis media, acute sinusitis, uh, chronic tonsillitis, acute tonsillitis, many of them, the first line treatments are a form of penicillin, either penicillin itself for like strep throat or others like amoxicillin or amoxicillin clavulonic acid. They're the most commonly prescribed and generally first line recommended treatment for a number of infections. Well, penicillin allergy is the most commonly reported drug allergy. In fact, about 10% of the US population or over 30 million Americans report a penicillin allergy. Um, so in fact, though, about 90% or more of those patients that carry this label are not actually truly allergic when tested. A lot of patients get confused about what is the side effect versus an allergy. And actually, if they've had an IgE mediated allergy, it may have been lost. So for those truly with IgE mediated allergies, about 80% of those will lose their sensitivity in 10 years. Many of them confuse their symptoms and report intolerances or drug virus interactions. For example, the amoxicillin and Epstein-Barr viral interaction that will cause a rash like hives. They may be frequently confused with a true penicillin allergy. And many patients claim that their parents told them they were allergic. I've had patients in there that have had family members where one person had an allergic reaction and told their entire family, even infants, like never to take penicillin, even those patients, even though those patients had either one taken penicillin in the past and tolerated it fine or never had it before. So what are the consequences of this? Well, the problem is this mislabeling, this, this misdiagnosis will often lead to overuse of other antibiotics, particularly broader spectrum. So this causes higher healthcare costs. It also increases our risk of antibiotic resistance, which resistant bacteria are potentially a problem, and also suboptimal antibiotic therapy. Some of these alternatives are not necessarily ideal for treating the current infection. In fact, sometimes it's a penicillin that's really the best choice for treating certain infections. And again, people have these side effects like headaches, nausea, things that may be completely unrelated to a potential uh, penicillin allergy are reporting them as having penicillin allergy or they're reporting them to the healthcare providers and that is be, that intolerance is being listed as an allergy on their chart. And so this causes a lot of fear and labeling to occur. So fear in that once this label is on the chart, patients frequently forget what that was originally. They frequently can't remember. Well, what, when you ask, what was your reaction to penicillin? I'm not really sure. I don't, I don't remember what it was, or I think it's in my chart and it isn't always documented what that reaction is. So then that leads them to be prescribed these other drugs that potentially they could probably take a penicillin um, and actually get better treatment for it. Another thing is that that labeling, people will carry that throughout their medical 
history. And it's very difficult to get that label removed. So we do get referrals to our office purely so that the patients can be tested um, and have this proof that they are no longer allergic. Uh, either reassurance from other providers, or I've had even a few referrals from the military where patients couldn't be enlisted or there were issues with them being enlisted because they had certain potential allergies. So this is just one particular study of patients uh, in the head and neck surgery realm undergoing head and neck free flap reconstruction, just to kind of give you an idea of when a, an, uh, penicillin may be a better choice than what we will usually give. So these were 427 patients who had a free flap. These surgeries were performed between 2006 and 2013. Um, and you'll see here at the bottom that uh, patients that had uh, ampicillin cell bactam prescribed really didn't have an increase in any surgical site or postoperative infection. But you'll see if they were given clindamycin, which tends to be standard in many practices, if you're penicillin allergic, it actually increased your risk for a postoperative infection. Looking at specific surgery site and surgical site infections with clindamycin usage, which again is frequently used as the alternative for penicillin in penicillin allergic patients. This particular study published in 2016 found that there was a fourfold increased risk for surgical site infections if clindamycin was used instead of a penicillin. So if there, you are suspicious for a penicillin allergy and you at least don't have the ability to test for penicillin allergy, they suggest using alternatives like cefuroxine um, so that you don't see that increased risk of surgical site infection. And we'll go over why potentially cefurox, cefuroxime is a better um, choice. So what is penicillin allergy testing? Well, it's a two to three step process that uses penicillin and controls to rule out a type one or IgE mediated hypersensitivity reaction in patients that carry that penicillin allergy label. So this involves using first a prick test, that's the first step, then followed by intradermal tests, and then followed by an oral challenge. Now, we do the oral challenge in our practice. It, technically, it is considered optional, but I feel like it's a good uh, adjunctive measure to confirm in your mind and in the patients that they truly are not penicillin allergic. Recommendations for these come from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the Quad AI and the college, as well as the Internal Board of um, Medi Internal Medicine. Um, and there are also a number of stewardship uh, programs that will recommend penicillin allergy testing. In fact, there are large flyers. There's, there's usually like a World Penicillin Allergy Day that is sent out by the CDC to make patients and healthcare providers aware that penicillin allergy is a big problem in our healthcare system. And that many people actually don't have a true penicillin allergy. Um, but because of this mislabeling, um, they're given different antibiotics, they experience more side effects. So it has a large impact on the healthcare system. And many of these have a lot of good information in them with referrals for testing. So who can be tested? Well, any patient that has a history of a reaction to a penicillin antibiotic that may be IgE mediated, um, and any patient who is currently denied access to such out of concern for such a reaction. Now you do wanna exclude those type four or other non-IgE mediated disorders. So anything that is a cellular reaction, things like Steven Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, DRESS, which is the drug rash with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms, and any patient that has a negative histamine scratch test, so those patients that are currently on antihistamines or patients with um, an allergic skin. So what are the risk factors for potential penicillin allergy? So who is at risk for this? Well, patients with frequent or repeated courses of penicillin, particularly high-dose IV administration. So for example, one patient I um, had tested uh, who developed a pen potential penicillin allergy had been treated with rat bite fever. Uh, I had not heard of that, but one of the big treatments for that is uh, high-dose IV penicillin. Um, age and other ATP risk factors like allergic rhinitis are generally not considered important as a development, as a risk factor for the development of penicillin allergy. Um, 
However, age and medical comorbidities, you do want to be aware of because they may impact survival if the patient should have an anaphylactic reaction, which is very rare. Um, but you do want to make sure the patient um, is in generally good health and has been optimized for testing. Um, potentially those patients more with a female gender and potentially a family history, this seems to be unclear but actually family history is much more important in non-IgE or type four cell mediated um, drug reactions. These are much more likely to be inherited. So questions you wanna ask your patient, have you ever had an allergic reaction to penicillin? Again, many of them will say, well, no, actually so-and-so had this and they told me not to take it or um, someone in my family had this and so I just assumed. So actually the product, the predictive value of clinical history of a penicillin allergy is very low, 14%. So you wanna know, have they actually even had it and what was the reaction? Why was the antibiotic given? Again, it may have been a viral rash. What was the reaction and how was it managed? Um, again, you're looking to screen out those cellular mediated reactions like Stephen Johnson's or other drug rashes. How long ago was the last reaction to penicillin? Again, many patients will lose this up over time, up to about 80% over 10 years. So if it's been 20 years since they've had a reaction, they would be a prime candidate for screening if they didn't meet any of these other contraindications. Have you taken other penicillins? I mean, surprisingly, I've had people say, well, um, I, I, I was allergic to penicillin, but I've been taking amoxicillin just fine. Like, okay, why was that? Um, you do wanna make sure that they, um, and have they taken any other cephalosporin since the reaction that can be helpful to know as well. So if you don't routinely do this in your practice, but you're potentially thinking about adding it, uh, the penicillin allergy toolkit, which is available in the references has some really nice screening tools. Generally your goal in this history uh, taking process is to um, get an idea of not only are they uh, a good candidate for testing, but where might their risk lie? Uh, certainly when you test someone, you kind of want to have a good idea of are they low risk, are they medium risk, are they high risk? So looking at this form, this lays out common intolerances that patients will have and then stratifies different parts of their history um, into low, moderate to high and high risk and certainly things that are actually contraindicated um, like a dystonia or thrombocytopenia, non-IgE mediated types of drug reactions. And then it lets you kind of overall get the gestalt of uh, their treatment, their timing, how long ago the reaction was and other. So this gives you a nice, very simple thing that you can either scan or adapt for your EMR to use it to stratify these patients. And it makes taking the history relatively quick and simple. Here we have, <clears throat> the beta lactam ring that is part of um, the penicillin structure. So you have your beta lactam, beta lactam ring in the green area. You have their thiazolide ring, which is the yellow area. And then you have your side chain. So the side chain identity is, is important as the beta lactam ring. So why is that? Well, the beta lactam ring structure is preserved through all the penicillins. And if you have IgE develop to this beta lactam structure, you will be alerted to all, all penicillin family members. That's an important distinction here because you'll notice again, this side chain R. Now in the penicillin um, molecule itself, this is just a hydrogen. But when we look over at amoxicillin, you'll see that there is um, this nitrogen, hydrogen and another ring here. So there's a different structure here. And e these penicillin family members are defined by that side chain structure. Well, what happens if it was actually a side chain that the IgE antibody developed to? Well, that changes things because these are different between the different family members and actually the amino penicillins, which are amoxicillin, ampicillin, um, have the most different one and the most unique ones. And it's very possible that your patient might be allergic to just an amino penicillin, but could take the other penicillin safely. So this distinction is actually very important and is part of the penicillin allergy testing. Uh, I like to sort of make this a little bit um, 
more uh, more clear like for example the the r chains give their these um molecules their identity similar to different tattoos or haircuts or styles that we associate with famous celebrities so for example we have this particular celebrity and this particular celebrity now they have some very distinctive facial grimaces that many people are aware of except for my children or younger people they didn't really know who these people were um except for i mean they he, he wasn't his voice was in it but we just watched the new suicide squad 2021 and sylvester stallone does voice the shark character um so they're aware of him now but um these for the rest of us older people, um, these celebrities are well known to us. And although they have very similar facial grimaces, they have very different distinct identities. Um, and that's the importance of this R chain. So let's get to testing now. So what do you need to potentially do this? What do you need to add this to your practice? Well, generally you'll need a pre-pen, which is the benzyl penicillin oil polycyte lysine injection. This is the major determinant for penicillin. So it's penicillin oil, and it represents 95% of what penicillin is broken down to and um, accounts for about 75 to 90% of penicillin reactions. You'll also want penicillin G at a concentration of 10,000 units per ml, and this is a minor determinant. Now, it re represents about less than 5% of what penicillin is broken down to in the body. You will not find penicillin G in this strength. However, you can dilute it down per instructions given in the um, in the package insert to this particular strength. Um, there are also other resources um, that can describe to you how to do one to ten dilutions. That's essentially what, depending on the concentration of penicillin G, it, it can come in um, uh, five million units, twenty million units. It just depends on which strength you're buying, but you do want to dilute it down to that one to ten thousand unit strength. And depending on what your source of penicillin G is, there are different resources on how to do that. But it's generally using one to ten dilutions. <clears throat> Also, you'll use a histamine control as your positive control and, and saline, normal saline as your negative control, because again, these um, the penicillin G will be diluted generally with normal saline. So you'll want to use that for your control test. You do not you need to use glycerin because none of these antigens will be um, preserved in glycerin. There are additional testing supplies, which if you currently practice allergy should have readily available, including special allergy syringes, um, uh, syringe labels, prick testing devices, alcohol swabs, rulers. Essentially, this is your setup. It's a more simplistic setup than just your regular allergy testing. But again, adding to this, adding to adding this to your practice, particularly if you already do allergy, can be very helpful. Um, and it's a great service to your patients. It will have impact far beyond um, what you, you anticipate and getting that label off their chart if they're not penicillin allergic is a huge benefit. So how does this start? Well, ideally you complete this in the inner surface of their forearm um, in, a, in an area where there's not any tattoos or eczema eruptions or just normal skin. You do want to make sure that the patient is off any antihistamines or other medications that might interfere. Um, for example, benzodiazepines can sometimes interfere with testing. So you wanna make sure that they're off of any medications that could inhibit the histamine response. You're going to place one drop of the reagent on the skin um, and then complete the uh, test uh, according to the uh, device that you're using. So each prick testing device will have manufacturer's recommendations as to how to apply the test. So you want to use them and you do want to make sure that the tests are at least a couple centimeters apart. So your testing potentially will look something like this, where you have a positive control, a negative control, your uh, pre-pen, as well as your penicillin G. You're going to place a drop of reagent on the skin, and then you're going to prick through it with whatever testing device you have. You'll repeat that for all your controls, as well as the pre-pen and the penicillin G. 
Um, if you would like, you can block off the excess, but please do not wipe across the arm because it will contaminate the other sites. And then set your timer for 15 minutes because that's when you'll read this particular test. So you do wanna make sure that, that is it is read within 15 to 20 minutes. Um, if the negative, the negative control should be negative, meaning you should not get a wheel and flare response. However, if a wheel is five millimeters or greater within 15 to 20 minutes, you want to repeat that prick test. If you're still getting positive responses at the negative control, um, this is suspicious for dermatographism, where the skin at least isn't acting as we would expect it to, there's something going on, and you want to discontinue the test because it means that it is not valid since your controls are not valid. The positive control, control must be at least three millimeters or greater uh, within that time. And the positive response and a positive response uh, on these other tests is three millimeters or larger than the negative control. This is one potential recording form that you could use. This is a very simple and straightforward recording form for the skin prick part of it. So you'll see here is at the top is the histamine control. Um, you want to record the wheel size in uh, millimeters, and it needs to be at least three millimeters or larger. Um, and then you're going to re record the other responses below. Again, you don't need to worry about the red area. That's the flare. You really want to just record the wheel size in millimeters. And then we're getting to the next part. You'll see this listed on the form, the interdermal testing. Now, um, Here's examples of some negative prick tests done um, where you'll see in this particular side on the left, we've had a good histamine response of six millimeters. So we know that that test is positive, but we've had essentially no responses to the other tests. Here's a similar patient on the right where we see the histamine is a five. Um, we've gotten tiny responses, but they're negative. They do not meet the threshold for a positive test. So here are two examples of negative prick tests. Those patients will continue on to the intradermal portion of this uh, testing procedure. Here's an example of a positive test response. So here is someone that has had a positive response to their uh, histamine. They've had a negative, negative control, which is what we like to see. And they have had two robust wheels to uh, penicillin um, prepen as well as penicillin G. So both major and minor determinants of penicillin. This patient, you would stop. You would not proceed with any further testing. And unfortunately, they would keep that label on their chart. But again, and it's really rare to see this occur. Most patients you will see by far more commonly those negative tests that we first saw, and those patients will go on to proceed to the intradermal test. So how do you do this? This is normally done on the upper arm area as displayed here, and you're gonna wanna um, quarter off that, just similar to setting up the, the uh, prick testing on the inner for forearm surface. You're gonna wanna make sure you have a couple centimeters between each test and label them in advance. That can be helpful. What you wanna do is do an intradermal injection. So it's very similar to a, a TB test, and you're gonna raise a wheel of two to three millimeters under the epidermis. You want to trace the immediate per, uh, perimeter of the bleb. This makes it much easier later on to determine if there's been any response and, how, and it's very helpful in measuring it you wanna set the timer again for 15 minutes. Now you'll notice that there's, even though you're only testing the pre-pen and pen G, there's four uh, quadrants um, marked out here. The histamine does not need to be tested again, but you will do a saline control just to ensure that the skin still doesn't react. Um, but you do this test in duplicates because we wanna make sure that the, both those tests agree with each other. So there'll be two pre-pens and two pen Gs, and you want those to be concordant. Um, my recommendation for the blebs too is if you have otoscopes, uh, the speculums, the disposable speculums, you'll notice that otoscope disposable speculums come in a three millimeter, a four millimeter, and a five millimeter size. The three millimeter is usually what's used in children. So I recommend taking one of those three millimeter otoscopes. And if you press it on a patient's skin, it will make a perfect indentation of a three millimeter wheel. And it's very helpful in tr at least training your nurses, but I find even using it in practice is very helpful for them to be more efficient in placing these 
three millimeter blebs and it makes it much more consistent than just trying to eyeball it and measure it again. So that would be my recommendation for doing this. And so here's what you would place these um, two of the pre-pens, two of the pengees, and then one uh, saline control. So how do we interpret this? Again, you're going to read these tests in 15 to 20 minutes. So a positive result has grown three millimeters or larger um, than the negative control. There will often be a significant flare if uh, the test is positive, but we wanna really measure the wheel size and not the redness. Now, again, if the normal saline control produces a consistently positive response, it's just ideal that you, that you discontinue this test because there may be dramatic graphism in place or it's making the test unreliable. The chances of this happening are incredibly low, particularly since you didn't pick this up in the first round with a negative test, but it's still important to do it. Um, now, what happens if the two tests, like your duplicate pre-pen tests or your duplicate pen G tests are discordant, meaning one is positive and one is negative? Well, in that case, which is estimated to happen about 7% or less of the time, you just want to repeat um, the uh, the test and place another another one or two tests and literally take the best two out of three or three out of four. Um, that that's generally what is accepted practice in these cases. Having a discordant test is very unusual. I think I've only had it, has seen it once in my whole time as practice, but it does occur. And if that's the case, just place another test or two, and then again, take the best two out of three or three out of four. So here's an example of a negative intradermal test placement where you can see the tests have been placed. You see the mark outside of the wheel. Again, this is very helpful to determine wheel growth both beyond what was originally placed. And we see that we have two negative tests each for pen G and pre-pen. So this again, patient is considered penicillin negative. Uh, they do not have a penicillin allergy. This is very rare, but again, here you see a positive response. So we have someone with no growth in the wheel and we have two positive responses um, for the pre-pen and two positive responses for the pen G. So again, this person is just demonstrating reactivity um, to these antigens. Uh, we would not proceed with an oral challenge. We would potentially test them again in another few years to see if they have lost uh, their potential allergen. But again, here's some good examples of responses. And you can see how nicely, how easy it is to see that there's growth beyond the wheel. That way there's no question. So again, you would not proceed to the oral challenge. Now let's say that you have someone that has negative prick and intradermal testing. There is an optional oral challenge, although I don't consider this optional in my practice. I do do this. Um, this involves one or more, um, generally at least two incremental doses of penic oral penicillin, um, such as amoxicillin or penicillin itself. You want to monitor them for over an hour. Um, you can do this as an outpatient or inpatient. I've never done it inpatient. I've always done it outpatient. It's a very safe procedure. Um, but you do want to make sure you have the appropriate monitoring set up in your office to do so. As an inpatient, again, you're going to give uh, at least two incremental doses or more, or you can give a single dose of an IV beta lactam if that's what's indicated for the patient. The advantage of this is heightened monitoring by an RN and other healthcare providers and the off chance that there's um, a pen, an um, adverse allergic reaction. So this is looking at all those particular antibiotics that contain the beta-lactam ring, everything from edgetrianam to the cephalosporins to meropenem um, to uh, the penicillins themselves. And you can see that the structure is uh, highly conserved throughout. Um, we also can see how the side chains will differ and that gives the penicillin their very distinct identities. There's really not much crossover though with these other uh, pen these beta-lactam rings, despite the fact that you may get IgE generated to the beta-lactam ring itself, we really don't see much spillover between that. 
Um, what are the rates? Well, the highest rate is between the amino penicillins. Um, cephalosporins, it's thought that there was a lot of crossover between uh, penicillin and cephalosporin reactivity because of uh, early, early cephalosporins actually were contaminated in their manufacturing process with penicillin itself. So it's thought, it's thought that that high rate of crossover that was seen initially um, early on was due to that contamination with penicillin. Penicillin. Now, with the amino penicillins and cephalosporins, there's actually more of a, a higher degree of crossover, and that has to do because of the similarity of the R chains or those side chains. And then you see little to no uh, crossover with the uh, monobactams and the carbapenems. So it really seems like the R chain is very important. So we talked about that initial study at the beginning of the, the talk about how cefuroxine might be ideal and the importance of the R chain. Well, if you look at these um, particular graphs, and I find these, these tables to be helpful uh, because I really can't keep track in my head which R chains are similar to what and which ones are different. This categorizes the similarities and differences between all the different cephalosporins. And you'll find that cefuroxine has a chain, a side chain, that's completely different to all the others. Um, so it's a very low a a risk of crossover. The bottom one is a, another helpful guide where you see that cephalexin um, is frequently used. It's a first generation cephalosporin, has very similar side chains or the same side chain as some of the amino penicillins. Um, but you'll see again, cefuroxine has a completely different side chain from the penicillins and amino penicillins. So that's why it's a great choice if you're concerned about um, giving someone with a, a, a penicillin penicillin allergy, a cephalosporin, this is a nice choice. Again, there are other graphs that will kind of um, break it down for you in simple terms as to which ones are, which side chains are related, which ones are not related. So you can um, have a, a good guide post into what to prescribe for your patients. Um, I find these helpful. Again, you'll see cefuroxine is over here and the dissimilar structures unlikely to be cross-reactive. So now you've successfully tested your patient for penicillin allergy. You wanna make sure you document and educate them. Um, it's very important that you take this off their chart, document why that, you know, document the test itself. And then I actually, in my practice, give the patient a copy of their, their test results with a document that says that we've tested them, they've had an oral challenge, and that we've removed it from your chart, because it's not uncommon that someone else will come along and be like, oh, wait, this is off there. I know this patient has a penicillin allergy. They'll put it back on their chart. We really don't want that to happen. So putting this in your medical record is important. In addition, giving the test results, I think is important too, because our medical records are not all shared. People will use different symptom systems, um, different EMRs, and they don't necessarily talk to each other. So every place the patient has been in each of those medical systems, they're all different. If the patient has a copy of their test result, they can take it to these other medical um, providers, these other hospital systems, um, and show proof that they can have their penicillin allergy removed. And as much as they can do that, that, that is really important. Um, so you want to fully educate the patient, fully educate their caregivers, have them take a copy of their test results and share it with as many health professionals as they can, including their outpatient pharmacy, because pharmacies will frequently um, double check prescriptions and drug interactions. And highly likely their pharmacy has that penicillin label too. So precautions, again, this is real allergy testing. So you'll want to have an anaphylaxis setup or anaphylaxis kit, anaphylaxis toolbox. Um, you want to have an anaphylaxis protocol in place um, and be ready to treat any severe allergic reactions should they happen. The nice thing is, in general, with penicillin allergy testing, um, mostly what you can expect is whatever reaction they had before, it's highly likely that they will have the same reaction. So if a patient just had hives, um, it's highly likely should they have an adverse reaction that it will be just hives again. However, you still want to be prepared to have anaphylaxis um, treatment available should you experience that. Um, again, penicillin uh, prepen is contraindicated in patients that have had a marked uh, systemic reaction. Um, 
and pa patients known to be extremely hypersensitive to penicillin should not be tested. So anybody that had a penicillin allergy reaction where they tell you, well, I lost consciousness and I was in the ICU intubated for six days, any severe anaphylactic reactions like that would be contraindicated to this test. So here are some, there are many resources out there for penicillin allergy testing, antigen supply companies. Um, I think actually, this is a, a book we recently authored. There's actually a chapter about penicillin allergy testing in here and how to do it in your practice. So there are a number of guides available, um, allergy books. I do recommend this JAMA Network um, Toolkit that is um, listed here in these uh, resources. This was a really nice um, reference and it breaks it down to very simple with a lot of forms that you can either use um, without charge or you can adapt to your practice. So here's another, we saw that earlier testing form. Here's one that comes from the toolkit where you can, um, you have it all laid out for your prick test, your intradermal tests. Um, it have very, it's very helpful to document it and it has the protocol right there on it. So um, you have a number of these, um, um, uh, forms. I do want to point out there's a typo on the form. So you'll notice at this bottom. And in the last check, I hadn't seen that these, these, these forms had been updated. So when you do use them in your practice, please um, delete this. It says this test is indicated if the patient is unstable or compromised hemodynamically or the respiratory status. Um, if someone has a compromised respiratory status or is unstable hemodynamically, dynamically, that is not a good time for uh, testing. The patient should actually be stable in both um, their respiratory and cardiovascular system. So be sure to delete that. <laughs> That's a little bit um, uh, misleading. Uh, and then if you don't currently have an anaphylaxis toolkit or protocol, it provides you with sample medications, very helpful, the pediatric dosing, as well as the adult dosing for you to adapt to your practice. So I hope that you found this talk helpful. I would strongly encourage you to add penicillin allergy testing to your practice. Um, it can be very helpful for patients. It's a nice adjunctive revenue. And if you, um, if you already have an allergy practice, it can be a next natural best step. Um, for you as far as other things that you can add to your practice to benefit your patient. So I want to thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate and reach out and talk to me.
my name is Sarah Wise, and I'm going to spend the next several moments talking about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease diagnosis and treatment. I'm a professor of otolaryngology at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a rhinologist and also run our otolaryngic allergy program. These are my financial disclosures. As I mentioned, we'll talk about presentation, pathophysiology, and diagnosis of AERD, as well as various treatment options, concentrating on medical post-operative management. And we'll end with a discussion about biologics. AERD affects our patients significantly. As you can see here on a patient's clinic intake form, he is requesting a new nose. AERD or NERD, NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease is previously known as Samter's triad. It's a classic triad of nasal polyposis, asthma, and COX-1 inhibitor hypersensitivity. It's fairly prevalent in asthmatics and even more prevalent in asthmatics with nasal polyposis, being reported at approximately 30 to 40% prevalence in this patient group. It's associated with frequently recurrent CRS with nasal polyps and often can present with hyposmia or anosmia, especially when the olfactory cleft is the site of initial recurrence of polyp disease. The asthma associated with AERD can be severe and persistent, and oftentimes these patients do not respond completely to corticosteroids. This is a disease that typically begins in young adults it's not a disease of childhood, and family history is rare. AERD is associated with altered arachidonic acid metabolism that results in increased leukotriene synthesis, ultimately causing vas vasoconstriction, bronchoconstriction, increased vascular permeability, mucus hypersecretion, and eosinophil chemotaxis. There are lots of different medications that can inhibit COX-1. We typically think of ibuprofen, diclofenac, naproxen, and aspirin. But it's important to note that even acetaminophen can be a weak inhibitor of COX-1. Our group studied the longitudinal progression of AERD and noted that patients typically initially present with asthma. CRS with nasal polyps is developed later, followed by the aspirin sensitivity, although this can be variable depending on the individual. When we initially evaluate a patient with nasal polyposis, we'll ask about symptoms, duration, prior surgery and time to recurrence, current and prior therapies, and allergy testing for environmental allergies, as well as the use of allergen immunotherapy. Specific to AERD, we want to discuss reactions to aspirin or NSAIDs, tolerance of alcoholic beverages, severity of asthma, and the possibility of aspirin desensitization if the AERD diagnosis is known. So we'll go through a couple of case presentations to look at some differences in presentation. This is a 38-year-old woman who presents with hyposmia, congestion, facial pressure, sneezing, mucoid rhinorrhea, and cough for a couple of years. Various medications, both topical and oral, have not provided sustained symptom relief. The asthma is fairly severe, resulting in hospitalization as well as ED visits, and the patient's current FEV1 is 72% on fluticasone salmeterol inhaler. She notes ingestion of NSAIDs causes severe nasal congestion and has had a positive aspirin challenge. This patient has bilateral polyposis on endoscopy and severe opacification of the sinuses bilaterally on CT. We can see that her eosinophil count is quite high as also her total IgE is high and so is her urine LTE4. This patient has some mild reactivity to environmental allergens on testing and also has noted uh, greater than 10 eosinophils per high power, power field on surgical pathology from the nasal polyp specimens. The EPOS document has a nice flow chart for the diagnosis of AERD or NERD. You can see that it begins with symptoms and goes on to question respiratory reactions, presence of CRS with polyps and asthma, and then ultimately 
the flowchart ends in either a diagnosis of AERD or an exclusion of that diagnosis. We should also note that there are various methods of challenge available, oral, bronchial, and nasal, and they generally have similar sensitivity and specificity. When we look at another case, this is a bit of a milder presentation, a 25-year-old man with relatively similar symptoms to the previous patient believes he had an upper respiratory infection that just didn't quite resolve, and this is a frequent complaint in the AERD patient. Again, no sustained symptom relief with various medications, no diagnosis or history of asthma, although there are some signs and symptoms that may lead us to that diagnosis, such as a nighttime dry cough and decreased activity in daily life. Can't recall any recent NSAID or aspirin exposure and no history of allergy testing, although he does have nasal congestion and cough when consuming alcoholic beverages. Bilateral polyps are seen once again on nasal endoscopy, and you can see some scattered opacification and mucosal thickening of the sinuses on CT. Patient does have some peripheral eosinophilia, somewhat elevated total IgE and urine LTE4, um, but negative environmental allergy testing. So what about the alcohol consumption question? It has been noted that alcohol-induced respiratory symptoms can be seen with AERD, and these can be present in both the upper and lower airway at significantly higher prevalence than in CRS or control. It's also been noted that in AERD patients after undergoing aspirin desensitization that the alcohol-induced respiratory symptoms often resolve. The possible mechanism is thought to be due to polyphenols, which are naturally occurring substances frequently found in alcoholic beverages that block COX-1, although this is still under investigation. Some of our nasal polyposis patients undergo additional testing, and we often find markers of type 2 inflammatory profiles. This can help us lead towards considering biologics as a treatment. We often look for eosinophil level in the blood or tissue total IgE level, and it has been noted that eosinophil level um, in the blood correlates with elevated CT score and endoscopy score in CRS with polyp patients. What about urine LTE4? We'll sometimes order this when we're considering a diagnosis of AERD. Some initial studies found that certain cutoffs of elevated urine LTE4 suggest the presence of aspirin sensitivity by history or by challenge. However, we still need to investigate this further and delineate the clinical utility in various CRS with nasal polyposis endotypes. What about aspirin challenge? This can be performed in patients that have well-controlled asthma at the initiation of the challenge. Pre-medication with the medications listed uh, is often performed and the challenge is considered positive if the FEV1 decreases greater or equal to 20% or if there's a prominent nasoocular reaction. And you can see one um, example of a challenge protocol here on this table. This is an oral challenge. This is another example of a two-day oral challenge protocol. Of note that initial doses of aspirin are quite low in these protocols, beginning at about 20 to 30 milligrams on the first dose and eventually progressing up to um, 650 milligrams, which is two doses of standard aspirin or two uh, tablets of standard aspirin as sold in the US. Aspirin challenge can also be performed by inhaled lysine or nasally administered lysine. This is typically done in Europe rather than the US. And this is an example protocol for that. This is an example protocol for a nasal lysine aspirin challenge. So various reactions may occur during the challenge, and these are fairly predictable, like nasal congestion, eye symptoms, cough, wheezing, chest tightness. Some of the symptoms that would be associated with anaphylaxis are less common, like hives, flushing, nausea, or abdominal cramping. I think we're all fairly familiar with some of the side effects of long-term aspirin therapy, such as GI side effects and prolonged blood clotting. 
This is an interesting article that compared and contrasted some of the advantages and limitations of the gold standard oral aspirin challenge versus nasal lysine and inhaled lysine aspirin challenges. Of note, um, it somewhat depends on what the uh, individual center is used to doing and the patient characteristics as to which of these is chosen. However, in the US, it's typically the oral gold standard aspirin challenge. When patients undergo surgery, we oftentimes tell them to uh, discontinue their aspirin for a period of time. However, in patients with known AERD who are already on aspirin desensitization and maintenance therapy, we do not want to have them off of aspirin for longer than uh, 72 hours maximum. So there are protocols for reducing the patient's daily aspirin and then ramping back up after surgery. This is an example protocol uh, from Brigham and Women's, and I have used this protocol with um, great success in, um, many, in many patients. I'll talk just for a moment about uh, surgery. Typically, AERD patients, given the extent of their disease, will undergo bilateral full house endoscopic sinus surgery with or without extended procedures. It has been noted in the literature that aspirin sensitivity itself is not necessarily associated with the need for revision frontal sinus surgery, but prior surgery and more severe disease are. Also, in um, many patients who undergo revision surgery for AERD with nasal polyps, extended procedures like the endoscopic modified low throat may be employed. Sometimes these are even employed in primary surgery. Of note, polyps can recur in the low throat cavity, and there is a somewhat of a rate of revision in this particular study on the bottom, about 22%. So we'll spend the last portion discussing post-operative management considerations. Briefly, oral steroid therapy is often used post-operatively for um, AERD patients. It's typically short-term. It can also be used for acute exacerbations as well. The standard maintenance regimen for these patients is usually topical steroid therapy in the form of high volume irrigations with mometasone or pedesonide. Environmental allergies may be considered in these patients. Typically, based on the pathophysiology of AERD, um, and a specific hypersensitivity to an IgE-mediated uh, uh, allergen is not typically under consideration. However, it may play into the disease process in the patient's symptoms. We studied AERD patients who had central compartment involvement in their disease. So this would be defined as involvement of the septum, middle and superior turbinates, um, the central compartment of the nasal and sinus cavities. For AERD patients who had central compartment involvement, a distinct, distinctly high number of patients had clinical allergic rhinitis and or positive allergy testing. And so, in these particular patients, we do consider environmental allergies as potentially playing a role. We've also studied the differences by subtype in allergy prevalence. It's often thought that uh, it's equivocal whether CRS with nasal polyps is associated with allergy. And you can see in the group of CRS with polyps not otherwise specified that about half the patients had allergy and half didn't. However, in certain subtypes like allergic fungal sinusitis, CCAD, and AERD, especially with that central compartment component, there was a significantly higher uh, prevalence of allergy. So this certainly can be considered as well. What about dietary adjustments? So dietary salicylate modification has been advocated by some. There was a randomized control trial of 30 patients that noted decreased symptoms and endoscopic score with a diet, with a uh, altered salicylate diet. However, more recently, many allergists have um, stated concern that dietary, dietary salicylates are not acetylated and wine and beer is often avoided with this diet. So it's unclear if the actual salicylate avoidance or the alcohol avoidance is responsible for the improvement. Nonetheless, some patients will choose to employ a low salicylate diet and there are several examples that can be identified on the internet. This is just one example that shows various levels of salicylates in certain foods. 
More recently, dietary fatty acid modification has been advocated. This is a pilot study by the group at Brigham and Women's that showed um, decreased urine LTE4, decreased symptom scores in patients who employed this diet. There are also examples of the altered uh, fatty acid diet for AERD that can be downloaded from the internet. This is the Brigham and Women's example. What about leukotriene modifying agents? This can be considered an option. Um, in this particular paper, we noted that this is an option for patients with persistent symptoms that are not controlled by topical corticosteroids or sinonasal irrigations. You can see here a diagram of some of the different options for leukotriene modification. Of note, if Montelukast is chosen, liver function monitoring is not necessary, whereas it is with Zylutin. Aspirin desensitization, which I mentioned previously, is considered a recommendation as an adjunct for AERD following revision FES. In this study out of the University of Pennsylvania, 125 patients underwent FES followed by aspirin desensitization, and they were noted to have decreased oral corticosteroid use postoperatively, as well as decreased inhaled corticosteroid use. The final thing I'll mention is the biologic therapies. These are the immunologic targets of the currently available respiratory biologics. There are five available respiratory biologics that function along the TH2 immunologic pathway with targets like IgE, IL-4 and 13 receptor alpha, IL-5 and IL-5 receptor. Omalizumab was the first biologic that we saw come on the market for respiratory use. It binds to free IgE and ultimately um, lowers the levels of IgE. It's approved for asthma, chronic idiopathic urticaria, and as of late 2020, it's approved for CRS with polyps. Mepolizumab binds to IL-5. It is, the, it is the biologic with the most recent approval for CRS with polyps, but it's been around and used for asthma and eGPA previously. Reslizumab also binds to IL-5. The difference is it's administered in an IV infusion, whereas mepolizumab is administered subcutaneously. Both of these decrease blood eosinophils significantly. Currently, reslizumab is approved for severe asthma. Benralizumab also functions along the IL-5 pathway. However, it's a receptor binder. It's approved for severe eosinophilic asthma and is administered subcutaneously. And finally, dupilumab binds to the IL-4 receptor alpha, therefore affecting both IL-4 and 13. It, has, it was the first one approved for CRS with polyps. It's also approved for asthma and moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. In a recent uh, indirect comparison of biologics for CRS with polyps, this particular group compared dupilumab to omalizumab. You can see the two main dupilumab studies, sinus 24 and sinus 52, as well as the omalizumab studies, polyp 1 and polyp 2, with the patient characteristics noted here. And in the line with STARS, you'll note that approximately a quarter of the patients across the studies had comorbid asthma and uh, NSAID exacerbated respiratory disease. So these were AERD patients. In a nested analysis of dupilumab studies, Tanya Laidlaw and colleagues noted that AERD patients had significant response in both nasal polyp score and total SNOP22. And I could personally say that in my experience, the biologics tend to work quite well on AERD patients, um, specifically dupilumab. I personally have not had as much uh, experience treating polyp patients with omalizumab or uh, mepolizumab specifically for polyps. So with a discerning eye for diagnosis, close follow-up and post-op adjuvant therapies, 
treating AERD can be very rewarding. I think that this um, is a very interesting group of patients and I thoroughly enjoy taking care of them. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Reisacker, and I'd first like to thank the, uh, the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very excited to talk to you about immunothera immunotherapy alternatives today. So again, my name is Bill Reisacker. This slide is for people who can read very quickly. I will be discussing some off-label delivery of FDA-approved products during the lecture today. So everybody here knows that the burden of allergic rhinitis is extremely high. This is a very common condition and it's growing in incidence. 
it, uh, it produces not only a very high price tag economically, but also quality of life. Uh, people who can get to school and who can get to work are not really functioning at their ideal capacity. Their productivity is not what it should be, and the qual quality of life definitely suffers because of this. This is not only a problem in the United States, but this is a significant global health burden as well. About a third of people across the globe are suffering with allergic conditions, such as allergic rhinitis. This is also a problem with food allergy. Why should a simple peanut, just a simple food, cause so many problems in the world? The burden of food allergy is also very high. And again, not only a high price tag economically from direct and indirect costs, but also a huge impact on a person's quality of life. And not only the person who's allergic, but their families, their caregivers, their friends, really everybody in their network. People with food allergy live in fear of accidental exposures. And most of it comes from nine of the common foods. Sesame, welcome to the group. Now the classic triad of management for allergic disease, this is both for food and for airborne allergy. At the base of our pyramid is avoidance strategies. For airborne allergies, these are sometimes very difficult to do, but they are very important as part of the management. For food allergies, which don't have as many other options, avoidance is really the mainstay in treatment. Medications, these are also highly available for people with allergic rhinitis for, from respiratory uh, allergens. But again, for people with food allergy, the medication options are very limited. Maybe an antihistamine for the most mildest of reactions, but what happens invariably for more severe reactions is that people have to carry auto-injectable epinephrine and use them when they're experiencing a reaction. Now at the top of our management pyramid is immunotherapy, our underutilized, underappreciated gold standard, but also our disease-modifying treatment strategy. For airborne allergies, uh, this has been done for many, many years, and there are several options for it. Um, for food allergies, this has been becoming a recent focus on the treatment strategies, looking for ways to desensitize uh, a person against their allergen, their food allergen that they're allergic to. Uh, but sadly, for the people in the respiratory space who could qualify for immunotherapy, less than 5% of people are actually opting for this therapy. And it's a real shame because there are so many benefits to it. We see a decrease in symptoms. Uh, there's a decrease in medication use. Uh, medications tend to work a lot better. Quality of life goes up as well. And it also has preventative, amazing preventative effects, preventing new sensitizations, uh, as well as the preventing of uh, diseases like asthma. And for food allergies, uh, this gives uh, patients and their families a layer of uh, security and, and at least assurance that for, for a routine exposure or, or a contamination of a food, maybe they'll only have a very mild reaction or no reaction instead of having a severe or potentially life-threatening reaction. So it's kind of like an insurance policy that just gives them a little bit of confidence as they go out into the world, particularly when they eat out at restaurants. So the concept behind immunotherapy is really exposing the immune system in certain areas of the body to the very things that you're, that you're sensitive to. And we have extracts that contain all of these, uh, all of these allergens, respiratory and also even food allergens. Uh, but the key is really to get the extract to those areas of the body on a regular basis at a high enough dose for the appropriate period of time. And that period of time is about four years. So if you think about it, it's kind of like sending your immune system to college. Now, what are these special areas of the body where you can, you can actually do this therapy? How can you access the immune system? Well, you can do it through the skin. This has been done commonly with respiratory allergies. The intestine is another area where you can access the immune system, and that's been done largely for food allergies. And then there's the oral cavity, uh, which has been uh, accessed for the treatment of both respiratory as well as food allergies. And now that brings us to a little bit of a chronology of all the different ways that people have tried to get allergy extracts and allergenic proteins to the immune system. As I mentioned, subcutaneous immunotherapy, or SCIT, has been around the longest, about 100 years of clinical use mostly for respiratory allergies, although there are also ways to modify the allergens. Uh, they could be genetically modified so that the, uh, the T cell uh, sites, binding sites are still present, but the IgE binding sites 
are, are uh, mutated in some way. So it's uh, potentially a safer injection. And that's been done for food as well as uh, airborne allergies. Um, and uh, so there are also ways to use just specific proteins of the allergen in injection format. So there have been many ways of modifying the allergens to try to make uh, safer subcutaneous immunotherapy, because as you know, there is a waiting period and this should be done uh, in a physician's office. Oral immunotherapy has also been used for quite a while, just basically swallowing the allergen. And that has gained some recent popularity for food allergies. And as man many of you know, um, just this past year, uh, palforzia has been uh, approved by the FDA for the, for the treatment of uh, peanut allergy using an oral immunotherapy uh, scheme. Nasal immunotherapy, we hear reports about that every year. It hasn't really gained widespread uh, acceptance, but we see reports on that on a regular basis. Uh, bronchial uh, administration, as you can imagine, would be a very difficult uh, way to administer allergens, particularly to children. Uh, oral mucosal immunotherapy, this has been around for the past 50, 60 years. Initially, it was mostly small studies um, using liquid drops uh, placed underneath the tongue. Um, but, uh, and this has been done for respiratory allergies as well as, uh, as food. Um, there has been recently, over the last uh, several years, FDA approved sublingual products using, uh, using the allergy immunotherapy tablets, self-dissolvable tablets. And also using the oral mucosa, there have been many other delivery routes that have been uh, proposed to use this, uh, this area. Uh, epicutaneous immunotherapy, or EPIC, this has been, uh, been used and studied for respiratory allergies as well as food allergies. Um, and we may see that as, a, as another option for peanut allergic individuals, whether that uh, gets onto the market uh, with a uh, peanut patch, that we have uh, yet to see, but, uh, but that is possible as well. Now, the oral cavity is a really amazing place to give immunotherapy because the oral cavity's default response when it gets exposed to allergens is towards tolerance. And now this really makes sense if you think about it, because the things that we put inside our mouth early on in life usually were things that were safe for the body. It was food. So it was really, it was really important for the oral cavity and the immune system there to teach the body that these are foods, these are safe, these are things the immune system should not be reacting to. Because it really matters where allergens are exposed to the body uh, to how the immune system reacts to them. Uh, here you can see with oral exposure, which again, we're, uh, unless your, your child eats a lot of uh, dangerous things, uh, which some children do, unfortunately, most of the stuff that we put inside our mouths when we were really young uh, were things that, uh, that nourished us. And that leads to tolerance. Uh, now things that get exposed to the skin, uh, cutaneous exposure, that's more of a threat to the body. These are things like bacteria, viruses, uh, fungi, parasites. These were things that the body had to mount a reaction to because it felt like it was an invader to the body. So these things tend to lead that TH2, the T helper 2 memory, and that leads to the allergic phenotype. So potentially getting foods, getting that all over the skin, uh, that could potentially lead to sensitization. I know you're saying, well, how common is that to get foods on your skin? Well, I don't know how many of you have young kids uh, and, and if you've seen the meat, but it definitely happens. So oral mucosal immunotherapy really is a super category. It contains many items and they can be divided up. Uh, you can divide that up into allergens reaching one region of the oral cavity mucosa and reaching multiple regions within the oral cavity mucosa. And we have many examples of the uh, single, single region uh, strategies. Uh, liquid extracts are used in the sublingual space and uh, many of us are very familiar with that and I use that in my office as well. Uh, but many people also put those liquid drops in the vestibule area, the vestibule meaning the area between the, the cheek and the gums. And that also has been uh, anecdotally found to be very effective. Uh, allergy immunotherapy tablets, as I mentioned before on the other slide, these are placed in the sublingual space. Uh, there are pouches that also can go into the vestibule and patches that can go onto the, uh, onto the buccal surface and the lingual surface. Uh, and just to mention that the oral cavity mucosa has been used uh, for many years for the delivery of small molecules as well. So there is a lot of data in the literature about uh, oral mucosal delivery, although it's a little bit different when we're talking about large allergenic proteins. And we're gonna see that in just a few slides. Uh, now there also can be the delivery of these, uh, these extracts, these proteins to multiple regions in the oral cavity. Why not? There's a lot of real estate there, so why not utilize it? 
Uh, we're going to see also the dis distribution of longer hand cells or antigen presenting cells in the oral cavity mucosa in different regions really supports this concept. Uh, different ways of getting it to multiple regions could include a toothpaste, a mouthwash, a pacifier, a chewing gum, things like that. Uh, right now, the only thing on the market available um, for respiratory allergies in multiple region category is the, uh, is the toothpaste. And this delivery pl platform is also being studied uh, through an FDA approval pathway uh, for peanut allergy as well. And those are uh, phase one studies are ongoing uh, with that. So how is the oral cavity mucosa so unique? Well, believe it or not, it actually has the highest concentration of longer hand cells in the body. Uh, the density of T cells is also very high, even higher than we see in the skin. And there's very low levels of effector cells, things like eosinophils, mast cells, uh, and basophils, which is good because we want to get the therapeutic effect, but we don't want patients to get a lot of swelling and itching in that area. And down below is a study which was uh, done by Alum. Uh, and this was really a fascinating study where he looked at the, uh, the density of longer hand cells in different regions of the oral cavity. And as you can see there, from the, uh, the, sub, the sublingual area that was actually the lowest density of oral longer hand cells, where the highest density was present in the vestibule and on the, uh, the buccal membrane, the, the cheek, as you can see from the diagram over on the left. So now let's, let's dive into a little bit of what exactly is happening on the, on the oral mucosa. How do these allergy proteins actually get to the immune system? How does this work? Well, we first we start with the saturation solubility. So these large proteins get dissolved in some sort of a liquid, saliva, or in the case of the drops, the liquid that goes along with the drops, or the toothpaste is the slurry that's, that's created by brushing the teeth. And these allergenic proteins tend to have a bit of a positive charge. Uh, the mucosal cells, conveniently enough, have a little bit of a negative charge. So they actually bind to the mucosal surface with an ionic charge. That's, uh, that's very strong and really can't even be, be, be rinsed off. Um, it has to kind of wear off and it comes off after, you know, after about uh, 20, 24 hours almost. So uh, that keeps it there and allows the immune system to interact with it. Now, what is this interaction? Well, longer hand cells, which have a high affinity IgE receptor, they, um, they are able to pick up these proteins and they engulf these proteins. And what they do is they process the proteins and express sequences from the allergenic proteins onto their surface. Now, these proteins don't get right into the bloodstream because for allergenic proteins, these are very, very large proteins. So they can't gain direct access to the vascular system. Plus the oral mucosa is a non-metabolizing uh, mucosa. So the proteins don't break down spontaneously. They have to be broken down within the context of the, of the longer hand cells. Uh, and once they are broken down and processed by the longer hand cells, they head to the local, local and the regional uh, lymph tissue where they activate naive T cells. And they allow these T cells to, uh, to differentiate into T regulatory cells, which put, put the brakes on the immune system and T helper one cells. And these then get redistributed to the oral mucosa and uh, again, downregulate the immune system with respect to the allergen that it received and that and then when the next uh, time that allergen is exposed to that mu the mucosa and that surface, uh, it has less of a reaction. So that's how this whole process works. So just some of the key advantages of a sublingual immunotherapy, which is the one region uh, treatment, efficacy has been demonstrated over many years. Um, there were probably more double-blind placebo-controlled studies for sublingual immunotherapy uh, than for subcutaneous immunotherapy even, even though it has a less of a time that it's been used. And it's the most common method of delivery in Europe, and it's gaining much popularity in the, uh, in the United States as well. Uh, it has a favorable, favorable safety profile when compared with subcutaneous immunotherapy. Uh, and definitely a reduced uh, discomfort from injections and fear from in, of injections. Many kids are a bit needle phobic and a, a lot of adults are needle phobic too. Uh, it's fairly easy to administer at home, but not exactly for everybody. I had a, a chef who had no sensation in his, in his fingertips. So uh, he had a hard time with a, with a dropper vial, but there are other options like a pump. Um, it's very convenient to have some, uh, some level of home treatment. I see people in New York City and they are busy, busy people. They're on the go, either taking their kids places or they're going to work, uh, going to meetings. They don't have a lot of time to spend in the office. So something that they can do at home is very key. 
But then you have the other side of the coin, of course, when you, uh, when you bring something home, you don't exactly know exactly how much they're using. And sometimes that losing that monitoring effect is, a, is one of the downsides to it. Uh, there is an FDA approved option in the form of the allergy immun immunotherapy tablets. So what are some of the key disadvantages of sublingual immunotherapy? Well, it is an out-of-pocket expense. Uh, it's a personalized product. Uh, so it's uh, this in, the, in the liquid drop form. In the immunotherapy uh, tablet form, uh, it, is, uh, it, it is covered by insurance because it is FDA approved to some extent. So, uh, but the liquid drops, they are an out-of-pocket expense. They're a personalized product, uh, which can't be FDA approved. And therefore insurance companies are not yet covering it. However, when they see the, the cost uh, effectiveness of it, I think in the future, we will start to see insurance companies start to cover this therapy. With liquid uh, sublingual, there is still some debate about the optimal dosing, the number of allergens that should be used, the dosing schedule. Um, and there's also uh, you know, inconsistency in the concentration of, of major allergen within the different extracts. So that further complicates uh, the picture. Although luckily there is a very large therapeutic window. Uh, again, for the allergy tablets, while they are, are FDA approved and therefore covered by insurance, their single allergen in many patients are turned off by the fact that it only has a single allergen uh, where they are mostly multi-sensitized, uh, multi polysensitized. Um, it's also an addition, id additional item to add to the daily schedule. Putting drops under your tongue, that's not something that's part of your daily routine, so you have to find the time to do that, even though it's quick. Uh, because these extracts by and large are swallowed, they can exacerbate eosinophilic esophagitis as well. Uh, and I've had this happen in my practice, and we've had to stop therapy because of that. It's also very difficult for small children to use successfully. If you've ever seen a, a young child try to keep anything inside their mouth for two minutes, it is not an easy task. Although this is a very young guy for, uh, for getting immunotherapy, but it can be a challenge for kids. The World Allergy Organization came out with their position paper, and they had a very interesting stance. They said, compared to the sublingual region, Targeting the vestibule with alert allergen vaccine, again, that was that area between the cheek and gums that was so high in longer hand cells, targeting the vestibule has the potential to in, uh, induce enhanced immune deviation or tolerance, possibly with a lower potential for mast cell related local side effects. So this was very exciting and this really accelerated the development of oral mucosal immunotherapy, particularly some of the delivery methods that involve uh, expanding delivery to different areas, multiple regions within the oral cavity. So one of these methods is, uh, is targeting multiple regions with a toothpaste delivery system. And so I'll go over what this exactly means. So this is the daily immunotherapy dose, which is administered using a, a patented commercial grade toothpaste, but it's a delivery vehicle for the extracts. So it's specially designed to incorporate these allergy, allergy extracts, stabilize them and release them upon brushing. Some of the potential advantages over the sublingual drops or the tablets, um, the exposure of the, uh, of the allergy proteins to the expanded population of longer hand cells. Uh, there's also good stability because it's a semi-solid matrix for the proteins. Uh, adherence theoretically is optimized by integrating it into a daily routine, and it also should be easier for young children to use. So this was studied uh, at my institution. We looked at, uh, at a case series where we treated people with pre and co-seasonal um, oral mucosal immunotherapy using the toothpaste delivery. These were people who were allergic to trees and reacting in the spring season. And we saw that treatment in that pre and co-seasonal fashion, decreased symptoms, uh, decreased medication use. They had a decrease in skin prick testing reactivity. And this benefit carried over to the following years. And they decided to continue their therapy uh, in those following years. So this data was very encouraging, and this led to a New York State-sponsored study, uh, which uh, was, a, uh, was done over a period of 12 months. This was an open-label, real-world study, real-world meaning uh, the, uh, the, the people who participated in this study received the allergens that they would normally get during their immunotherapy. And the comparison was between liquid sublingual immunotherapy and oral mucosal immunotherapy using the toothpaste delivery system. Uh, the OMID toothpaste uh, demonstrated a 16% reduction in the total combined score at six months, which was very encouraging. Uh, we studied it out further, and we found there was a meaningful clinical improvement in both groups that uh, approached statistical significance. Again, the numbers were low uh, in the study based on how many we could afford with the grant. Uh, so it was hard to achieve statistical significance, but even with the low numbers we had, it came very close to statistically significant. 
Uh, we looked at IgG4 changes and we saw a nice bump in the IgG4. And this happened actually pretty early. Within six to nine months, we were seeing those levels peaking. So that was also very encouraging that we were getting those proteins to the immune system. That's really what the IgG4 is showing, is that you're getting it to its target. Adverse events, this was very interesting. We compared and we found that the adverse events, uh, while most were mild and transient, um, occurred really with the same frequency for oral mucosal immunotherapy using the toothpaste and sublingual using the liquid drops. However, the distribution was different. With oral mucosal, we saw that the, uh, the adverse events, which were again, mild uh, tingling, itching, uh, some mild swelling as well, were limited to the oral cavity, which makes sense because the delivery system, after it's, after it's kept in the mouth for two minutes uh, for a two minute brushing, is expelled. It's not swallowed, whereas the sublingual immunotherapy using liquid drops, it, by and large, is swallowed. So while we saw oral cavity reactions, we also saw skin gastrointestinal reactions, including EOE, uh, and even some upper respiratory and, and eye symptoms. Uh, adherence, there was a trend towards a decreased uh, dropout rate and an improved adherence rate uh, with, the, uh, with the toothpaste uh, cohort, uh, and the mean missed doses were, uh, were also less that makes a lot of sense. We were not surprised because we were tying this to, uh, to a regular uh, activity. And, uh, and this uses a fully functional toothpaste. So it fights cavities, it uh, cleans your teeth, it freshens your breath. So it fit in very well with their normal routine. So uh, these results were, were highly expected. So a sample protocol for mixing the OMIT uh, toothpaste, this can be done by a compounding pharmacy or there are kits available that this can be done in a physician's office. Uh, one to two milliliters typically is added to, uh, of concentrate is added uh, to a 16 milliliters of a base paste. Now this is thicker than a normal toothpaste. If you look down there, it looks almost like a, like a super ball or, or some clay that you got out there. So what you have to do is mix that with the liquid extracts and then it brings it up to a one X consistency toothpaste, which, uh, which is a, a 20 ml. So you have plenty of room to add multiple allergens uh, to this mixture. So it's mixed until homogeneous with a, with a very fancy mixing tool, uh, which we call a tongue depressor. Uh, and that's loaded into a metered pump, which delivers a very standard dose. And one pump typically lasts about three months. And this is used from home because this is your, uh, your daily routine. This can replace your regular toothpaste, uh, but you can also use a regular toothpaste or a favorite toothpaste uh, at a different time of the day, if you desire. Uh, so again, a, a precise metered pump is used, which is very important to know how much is, is coming out. And if you're already doing liquid uh, drops, uh, there's an easy conversion formula so you know how much to add to the toothpaste base so they're getting the same daily dose of concentrate. Uh, again, it's mixed in the office or by a compounding pharmacy. And the daily dose is two pumps per day, which can be divided up two pumps once a day or one pump twice daily. So again, that can fit in if they have a favorite whitening toothpaste or, or another type of toothpaste. You can do the allergy toothpaste in the morning and then the favorite one at nighttime. There's no specific escalation phase. They really can start with this at full strength. Occasionally in very young kids or people who get a little bit of tingling or itching or swelling in the very early phases, I'll have them start with an int introductory dose of one pump a day for about a week or two. And then they generally can all go up to the two pumps per day. It's a standard brushing for two minutes. Uh, I always instruct them to try to keep the, uh, the foam inside their mouth as much as possible. If they can't brush for the full two minutes, that's a long time, but that's how long you're supposed to brush and then you, you can expel it uh, at that point. Uh, as with uh, liquid uh, sublingual, there's no standard formulation protocol that exists. So it's really up to the clinician, the allergist who is prescribing uh, that therapy to decide how much concentrate for each allergen they want their patient to receive. So there's flexibility uh, and it's really dose agnostic. This is just delivery, a delivery system. So again, the ideal number of allergens, we still don't know. Uh, you know, treating a few allergens versus all of them, we just don't know. So that's again, a clinical judgment. And as with liquid sublingual, this is considered an off-label delivery uh, of the extracts, at least in the US for now. So with that, I would uh, like to conclude and say thank you. I hope I gave you some, uh, some food for thought, literally no pun intended, but this is a very exciting time for us who are treating allergies because there are so many things on the horizon and so many options that we're gonna be able to give our patients in the future. Thanks very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.
This session is about USP 797 compliance for an allergy practice and what it means to us. I've been involved in ENT allergy since 1977, and I've been sitting, setting up allergy clinics from around the country since 1999, and have been involved in an ENT allergy department since 2009, or up until 2019. And I've worked with several Florida practices, both setting up new departments and doing reviews of existing allergy departments. I am a contract trainer with ALK, and my husband is a manager with ALK as well. These are the references that I use for uh, preparing for this presentation. It is, would be recommended that you download a copy of the USP 797 guidelines, which you can find at this website down here. Um, there are, are a lot of air, gray areas open for interpretation, so that's why the recommendation would be for you to read through those guidelines as well. So USP stands for United States Pharmacopeia, <clears throat> and it was launched in 2004 because up until that time, there were 64 deaths related to compounding as well as other non-fatal injuries. Now that's not because of compounding allergy because the allergy has a hundred year safety record, but because of compounding medications like chemotherapy, et cetera. So they did come up with some recommendations for allergy departments. Uh, as of December 2013, those recommendations became official guidelines, and they have revisited those guidelines, that the, and the new guidelines were supposed to be put into effect as of December 2019, but they are currently on hold due to appeals, not regarding allergy but regarding uh, beyond use dates with pharmacies, et cetera. So the recommendation is to go ahead and put these new guidelines in place. So we're gonna talk about the facility requirements initially. So you have one of two options, the ISO class five primary engineering control, which is a PEC. That would be more of a prime uh, pharmacy setting and a clean room with a hood, unidirectional airflow. But for allergy departments, um, you'll need to follow the dedicated allergenic extract compounding area, AECA guidelines. So um, it would just be a matter of picking a room within your clinic to do the compounding. And during compounding, only authorized personnel is um, admitted. And it can be a room that has dual purposes or dual uses as long as those activities are not being done while compounding or mixing is going on. The surfaces need to be cleanable, resistant to damage, smooth, impervious, non-shedding, free from cracks and crevices, no carpet, and dust collecting overhangs minimized. Well lit, temperature and humidity controlled for the person who is compounding's comfort, and then away from unsealed windows, exterior doors, and traffic flow and away from environmental control challenges. Examples of this would be warehouses. Um, you would not want a door leading into the room that you're compounding from a restroom, as well as you don't want to compound in the lunchroom. <clears throat> as far as cleaning and disinfecting, work surfaces need to be cleaned and disinfected daily or on days where you're actually compounding. They need to be cleaned if surface contamination is known or suspected. They want you to use sterile 70% IPA to the work surface between each prescription set. So whenever 70% um, alcohol is mentioned, they do tack on the sterile to it. So as far as cleaning work surfaces with sterile 70% IPA, I am, you have the option of ordering a a spray bottle of sterile 70% alcohol from your medical supply company. And then when you're wiping vials, you would use those sterile prepackaged alcohol swabs or wipes. The walls, door, doors, and door frames will need to be cleaned and disinfected monthly and when surface contamination is known or suspected. And then ceilings cleaned and disinfected when visibly soiled and when surface contamination is known or suspected. I think what they're referring to here would be if there were to be a leak and the ceiling, it would affect the ceiling that could potentially harbor mold. So that would need to be taken care of. File star stoppers wiped with sterile 70% IPA and allowed to dry. 
And then as far as personnel qualifications, you would want to have one designated person that's over USP in your, in your department. <clears throat> and they would oversee, evaluate, supervise allergenic extract preparation protocols. This would include the uh, coordinate the initial training and annual evaluations. The annual evaluations um, consist of sterile compounding, garbing, and hygiene, which we will go over in detail, and then document written or electronic tests, testing results. Um, as far as this test is goes, um, you do have an option of taking an electronic test through um, I'm aware of the AAOA offering one as well as the Quad AI. <clears throat> and then organize reoccurring annual testing. And part of the uh, reoccurring annual testing would include a fingertip and thumb sampling test as well as a media fill test. And we'll go over each of these individually as well in detail. <clears throat> so as far as personal hygiene and garbing, Hand hygiene would consist of removing visible debris from underneath the fingernails using a disposable nail cleaner and wash your hands and forearms up to the elbows under warm running water for 30 seconds. And you dry your hands and forearms using a low lint towel or, dr or dryer. They do not want you to use the brushes that are commonly used in the OR or hand dryers must not be used. The blow dryers for the hands must not be used. And they want you to use a closed system of soap, not a, um, a refillable soap system. For garbing, um, when you get ready to compound, you would use a low lint disposable garment that fits snugly around the neck and the wrist and opens and ties in the back. And I would recommend a breathable one because hopefully your department will get to the point where you're mixing or compounding for several hours at a time and you don't want to be wearing a, a plastic gown that would um, be uncomfortable. Low lint disposable hair cover for the head. <clears throat> These are just the um, you know yellow bouffant hair covers, um, yellow or blue, the inexpensive ones. And notice that they say disposable. A disposable face mask, we're all wearing face masks now, but when you get ready to compound, you would want to change that face mask to a clean one. And then sterile powder free gloves. When garb is visibly soiled or its integrity compromised, it must be replaced immediately. As far as hand sanitizing goes, um, let's talk about what this looks like. So you would do your hand hygiene and then you would um, come into the AECA, the area where you're gonna compound and you'll, you'll don your, your, um, your gown, your cover for your head, your face mask. And we have touched non-sterile or non-clean items at that point. So they want you to use an alcohol-based hand rub prior to donning your sterile gloves. And then gloves are to be um, cleaned with sterile 70% alcohol whenever non-sterile surfaces are touched. Okay, let's talk about the, the kits, the fingertip and thumb sampling, as well as the media fill test. <clears throat> so this is what the, the kit would look like for the fingertip and thumb sampling test. At the end of this presentation, I do have a list of companies that supply these kits. So with the fingertip and thumb sampling, the purpose of this is to show that you can don sterile gloves without contamination. So this would uh, initially be done three times and then one time annually after that. As far as the initial three times that this is performed, it would have to be after three separate hand hygiene and garbing. So the recommendation would be if you um, get ready to compound one morning, go ahead and do your hand hygiene and garbing and do this test. And then maybe after lunch, when you come back and you redo your hand hygiene and garbing, repeat the test and then the next morning repeat it. So you use a separate sampling device for each hand and label it with a 
personal identifier, the right or the left hand, date and time. This works best with a two person system having another person with sterile gloves on and that person would actually lift the lid of the plate and do their fingertip and thumb roll under the onto the auger. And then the second person would put the lid back in place and invert the, the, the tray. You want to invert it when you store it so the condensation does not drip onto the auger. Then the second person would take the second plate that, and lift the lid and the person that's doing the test would do their fingertip and thumb roll. So with this test, you would want to incubate it for seven days at body temperature, 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, and then five days or two days, excuse me, two days at body temperature, 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, and then five days at room temperature, 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And once again, store this inverted. Now, as far as incubation goes, <clears throat> the companies that supply these kits do have a program where you can just order the supplies and incubate them within your practice, or the company will provide you with all the packaging so that you could, and ice pack so that you could ship it back to them. They would incubate it, interpret it, and then send you the results. You, if you were to interpret this yourself, you are going to be looking for colony forming units or CFUs per hand and determine the test outcome. And during this process, you're, you're going to visually observe the person who's being tested for hand hygiene, garbing, et cetera, and then document results. Make sure you keep documentation of the results and corrective actions. Let's move on to the media field test. And this is what the supplies look like for the media field test. With this test, it's going to um, check to make sure you have good sterile or aseptic technique. And this is done once a year. And so usually it's, it's performed at the same time that you're doing the fingertip and thumb sampling. So with this test, what you're doing is manipulating the testing components to, to simulate sterile sterile compounding activities. So um, basically what you're going to do is take a sterile 3 ml syringe and transfer a half an ml of this solution to a sterile empty vial, repeating that nine times for a total of 10 transfer, changing your needle between each transfer. So we now have five mls of solution into this vial. Then you're going to take a sterile five ml syringe and transfer five mls of this diluent into this vial. You would then label each of these vials and, and incubate it as well. So as far as the incubation goes, it would be seven days at room temperature, the 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, and then seven days at body temperature, 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. You would determine the test outcome by a visual um, observation for turbidity, manifestations of growth, cloudiness, et cetera. So once again, this can be done within your practice as long as you have access to an incubator or you do have the option of sending it back to the company to have them incubate, interpret, and send you the results. In the event of failure, you do need to document corrective actions and personnel who fail to sterile, fail sterile compounding must pass reevaluations before resuming compounding activities. And keep in mind that personnel who have not compounded in more than six months must be reevaluated. So in your, in your clinic, in your allergy department, if you have someone that's the main person and then you have someone who is the backup, you would wanna make sure they get in there periodically to do mixing so that they would not have to go through this reevaluation more than once a year. <clears throat> so this is what it would look like if you failed. You can see here on the fingertip and thumb sampling, the colony forming units. And um, you can tell this one 
most likely was, in, was intentionally contaminated, lots of units there. And then for the media fill test, you can see that we have a, a clear solution here and then a cloudy solution, which would indicate growth. And there are um, tools out there for assisting you when you're uh, doing your observation for hand hygiene, garbing, et cetera. Additional considerations as far as beyond use dates, um, prescription expiration date should be no later than the earliest expiration date of any component, including the diluent. And the beyond use date must not exceed one year. Now with allergy, we all know that it depends on what diluent you're using, the glycerin percentage that's in the vial that determines the expiration date. Labeling. <clears throat> You need to, on the patient treatment bio, you need to have the patient name and date of birth, at least two identifiers, the type and fractional dilution of each vial with the corresponding vial number. There are many ways to do this. Beyond use state, storage conditions, two to eight degrees Celsius. As far as shipping and transport, my recommendation is just to, sh to ship it and transport it the way the the extract company ships and transports it to you. Here is an example of labeling patient treatment vials. On the left here, you can see an example of labeling that is done through an allergy specific EMR. And with allergy specific EMRs, they typically, um, every patient vial has a bar scan as well as Every concentrate has a bar scan. Every allergen dilution has a bar scan as well as the diluent vials. So it's a nice way to make sure that you um, are pulling the correct vial and it's a double check system. Um, they typically have the recipe in the EMR that links to these um, vials and dilutions and patient label. <clears throat> as well. Here's an example of a handwritten label, which is probably most commonly done. As far as document documentation, it can be written or electronic. Um, you do need to have SOPs in place, including the USP guidelines, including um, those steps to follow USP guidelines, personnel training records, temperature logs, <clears throat> prescription set compounding records and this needs to you need to have access for the prescription set compounding records to the patient's name date of birth etc the concentration of the extract that's being used the volume and somewhere you need to have access or available the vendor or manufacturer lot number and expiration date so it's very important that you keep a log of what lot numbers and their expiration dates and the date that was put in use for every extract that is being used, as well as diluent. When you're preparing um, a patient treatment vial, you need to include the preparation date and time, internal identification number, that can be done many, many ways, identity of in individuals involved in the compounding process, total quantity compounded, and the assigned beyond use date and storage temperature on the actual vial, on the label, and then QC procedure results. So you need to have another person that is trained to be able to check the work of the person who is, done, is doing the mixing and the compounding. And this person would check to make sure that the test results were carried over to the compounding record and or the mixed record and that the correct dilution is listed on the recipe. I'm gonna check the math for the total allergen volume, diluent volume and total quantity. Then she's going to check or she or he is going to check the, the label on the patient treatment vial to make sure the correct information is on the vial and then that, that they're the volume is correct and that the checking for any um, observation of any 
issue that might be involved with this, the, the treatment vial itself as far as floaters or contamination, cloudiness, et cetera. Uh, you would also need to keep track of any complaint and adverse event information. So um, this is something you probably already have established in your practice, but these adverse events need to re be reported to the manufacturer as well. And this is something that the FDA does require. So investigation and corrective actions need to be included. Now, this is an example of what a prescription treatment set would include. include. So you have, um, and there are many forms of this out there, you have the, the quantity or the volume, and then you would put the dilution number, and then um, all of the extra information that is required according to USP 797. So this is pretty much what USP is about. You have your fingertip and thumb sampling kit, your, um, your media fill test kit, your SOPs in place. This is what you would look like when you are count compounding and an example of the vials for the patients. These are the suppliers that I am aware of that have those kits available for the fingertip and thumb sampling as well as the media field test. And this is my contact information if you have any questions.